So in this lesson, we are going to, I mean, I think shockingly, uh, learn about how to compute complex exponents. So we're going to be dealing with things like, how do I do 3 to the i power? How do I figure out 17 to the 3i plus 5 power? So that's what we're going to be working with today, and it's exciting. But before we get started, let's take a deep breath. And let's begin. So I want to start this with a, I don't even know if I should call this a warm-up, sort of a calculator exercise. I want you to use your calculator to compute e to the i pi minus 1. You might not have even been aware that your calculator has the imaginary number on it. If you've got a TI-84, um, it's right above the decimal button. So if you do e to the i pi minus 1 on your calculator, you find that this is negative 2. Now, if you are reflecting on this at all, um, I hope that you are wondering, like, why? What, what is this even about? Uh, in this video, I'm going to be getting into that. I'm going to be talking about why this is negative 2. I I'll be honest, I'm not going to be able to give a super deep answer because we need a whole lot more calculus, which we will learn in this class, but we need a whole lot more to really, really deeply understand it. I may try and put together a second video that tries to address a little bit of it, but for today, I'm just going to be getting you uh, through a bit of an understanding of, of why and how this works and how we can apply it to other situations. It just occurred to me, you might have gotten an error when you did this on your calculator, and if you did, you're going to need to go to the mode. So if you go into your mode, down near the, like right in the middle, there's a spot where it says real a plus b i and r e to the theta i power. If you set it to the a plus b i, you won't get an error when you do these things. I apologize that I didn't mention that earlier. All right, so here's our key point uh, that, that's going to carry us through this entire lesson. You're going to have to, again, you have to trust me on this one. I can't really get into all of the depth of why this works because we need a lot more calculus and I don't want the video to be that long. Um, but it turns out that r e to the i theta means exactly the same thing as r cis theta. And like I said, you, you got to trust me. This is true. There's a whole lot of really great math for why it happens. Um, but for now, you got to trust me on it. This expression on the left is called Euler's form named for the same Euler that, you know, sort of named Euler's number. And the thing on the right is polar form. Okay. And so, for instance, if, if you encountered something like e to the 4i, this just means, you know, like 1 e to the 4i. You could write this as 1 cis 4. So, you know, the, the r that's in the front becomes the r that's in front of polar form. And then the number that's up here next to i is the thing that we're going to put inside of the cis here. And then if you wanted to actually compute that, you'd go through and you would do cosine of 4 plus i sine of 4. Okay? So, again, this thing on the left is called Euler's form. The thing on the right is polar form. This just allows us to convert between the two of them. So now I want to revisit that warm-up. Um, this is something that we could actually do by hand, Right? How would I write e to the i pi? How could e to the i pi be written in polar form? Right? Wouldn't this just be cis pi? I suppose if anything, it would be it would be one cis pi. So that means cosine pi plus i sine pi. And then using our knowledge of the unit circle, cosine pi is negative one, and sine pi is zero. So 1 e to the i pi is negative 1. And so to do this thing, I'm getting negative 1 minus 1. That's negative 2, which is exactly what our calculator told us. So this ability to take uh, e with an imaginary power and turn it into polar form is going to allow us to unlock the ability to do a complex power of any number. Really, the rest of this video is, is just us practicing that and looking at other ways and places that this can come up. So this next example is asking us to find the value of 4e to the i pi over 3 in the form a plus bi. So I'd encourage you to pause the video, try this one on your own. Um, what you should be doing in terms of a method is taking this, converting it into polar form, and then once it's in polar form, uh, you know, doing the operations and putting it into Cartesian form. So based on what we learned just, just a few minutes ago, I'm going to take this and I'm going to rewrite this as 4 cis pi over 3. That means that this is 4 times cosine of pi over 3 
plus i sine of pi over 3. So 4 cosine of pi over 3. Pi over 3 is the one up here. So cosine is the short value, so that's a half. Plus i times, and sine is the tall one. That's the square root of 3 over 2. And then I just distribute my 4 in, and I get 2 plus 2i root 3. And there it is. Keep in mind, by the way, now that you sort of really clearly know where the i button is on your calculator, you could actually take this and just punch it into your calculator. You can do 4e to the i pi over 3, and you should find, it'll give you a decimal version, but it's going to give you this thing, and that allows you to check it. This next example is kind of neat because it shows you something about Dumov's theorem and what we understand about powers already. So I'd like us to express this complex number, negative 1 plus 3i, in the form r e to the i theta, and then hence find a negative 1 plus 3i raised to the fifth power. So your process for doing this is going to be to take this and effectively convert it to polar form, find the modulus and the argument, and then put that thing into r e to the i theta. So pause the video, go ahead and work through this. Um, I know it may have been a little while for you since you've done these, um, so make sure that you're careful about finding the argument. Uh, so go ahead and give that a shot. All right, so first I'm going to find the modulus of negative 1 plus 3i. I do that by doing the square root of negative 1 squared plus 3 squared. I've noticed in some of your work that some of you have been doing 3i squared. You always just do the imaginary part. It's just the 3. So when I carry this out, this is the square root of 10. Then for the argument, to find the argument of negative 1 plus 3i, I'm supposed to do the inverse tangent of the imaginary part over the real part. And when I did that on my calculator, I got negative 1.25. But this complex number, negative 1 plus 3i, is up here. Remember, anytime we wind up with something that's in the second or in the third quadrant, we need to add pi to this. Because what really happened here is that this negative 1.25 that we got, that's down here. We have to add pi so that we get the appropriate argument. So I added pi to this and I got 1.89. So now that I have the modulus and the argument, I can write this thing as the square root of 10 cis 1.89. Or actually, I mean, I suppose if you can see it, you don't even really have to go through this step. We can just go directly to this form. It's the square root of 10 e to the 1.89i. So this is sort of part one. Now they want me to take this thing, 89i, and raise it to the fifth power. Now, interesting sort of story for you here. The first time that we learned to do this was when we learned Dumov's theorem. And if I took this thing and raised it to the fifth power, what would Dumov's theorem tell us to do? Wouldn't it tell us to use this as a power here and we would multiply it with the argument. Check out what happens over here. Over here, I'm just going to use properties of exponents, right? What I have is I have the square root of 10 times this thing. And that means that this fifth power is going to get distributed to both of these things. It's going to get distributed to both of these. So I'd have the square root of 10 to the fifth power, and I'd have e to the 1.89i to the fifth power. But, you know, kind of funny story here. What happens when I have a power raised to another power? Don't I multiply those powers together? Just like I'm multiplying the 5 to the argument here, we're going to wind up getting the exact same thing here. So when I multiply this by 5, I'm getting e to the 9.46i. And the square root of 10 to the fifth, um, I mean, I could just express that as 100 times the square root of 10, because two root 10s will get me 10, and then two more root 10s will get me another 10, and I'll have the root 10 that's still left there. And there it is. That, that's my answer. This problem didn't say what form I needed to express it in. It didn't say, oh, putting it in Cartesian form. So it's okay for me to just stop here and leave it here. If I really wanted to convert this into a plus bi, I would take this and put it into 
r cis theta form. And then from there, I would split it into two pieces and make it a plus bi. So I think what I wanted to illustrate through this example is that what we knew about Dumov's theorem is shown through Euler's form and our knowledge of what happens with exponents. So here's where I think this lesson gets really exciting. Um, I'm going to ask us here to evaluate 5 to the i. And what we've been doing so far in this lesson is we've been dealing with things that are i, I'm sorry, not i, e, raised to some imaginary power, like e to the 2i. We haven't really dealt with anything that's 5 to the i or, or anything like that. So the rest of these examples, the rest of what I'm doing here are going to be about complex exponents on bases that are not necessarily e. And here's the secret. The secret is, and I know we've only been practicing this for about 10 minutes, but we're pretty good at dealing with things when the base is e. So my question to you is, how could I rewrite 5 to have a base of e? What could I do here? And this is another one of those examples of me talking about like unsimplifying, that for so much of your mathematical career, you guys have been asked to simplify things, to make them easier, make them smaller, make them simpler. Lots of times we actually want things to be less complex because we want them to have a very specific form. So I've left this here for a while. This does not mean five, this doesn't mean five equals e. It means what power would I have to raise e up to in order to get five? Okay. So what this is going to be is this is going to be the natural log five power. Okay. And if you need a little bit more convincing about that, remember that we, we've, we've always had this idea of like exponential form and logarithmic form. If I took this thing and rewrote it in logarithmic form, I would get the log base e of 5 equals the power, natural log 5. And the log base e of 5, sure enough, is just natural log 5. So the secret to dealing with these problems, where the base isn't e, is to take the base and change it so that it has a base of e. So now this problem, instead of being 5 to the i, is e to the natural log 5 to the i. Okay, All I did there was I replaced the 5 with my e natural log 5. And then we want to think, well, what's going to happen with this i? Well, when I have a power raised to another power, remember my properties of exponents tell me that I can multiply those powers together. This will be e to the natural log 5 i. And I just put that in parentheses because I didn't want to have like a natural log of i. That seemed like that was going to get really weird, and I, and I didn't want that. And that's not what we should have. These should be multiplied. But wait a minute. This is now e raised to a power. This is now the thing that I'm good at. How could I take this and rewrite it in polar form so that I could write it in a plus bi form? Well, hopefully you recognize this thing basically has a modulus of 1 out here. So this will be 1 cis natural log 5. That means that this is cosine natural log 5 plus i sine natural log 5. And we can evaluate that on the calculator. So this, by the way, should be done in radians. Because the number that I'm working with here, like this isn't a measurement of degrees. This is, I need this as a real number. And radians are a much more sort of real and, and tangible and meaningful number. So the cosine of natural log 5 is negative 0 0.0386. Plus the sine of this is 0.999i. And so this is what 5 to the i power is. Now, I know that this is all sort of, you know, like surreal to you. Um, and, and I apologize that I haven't been able to get into some of the depth on why this thing works the way that it does. And like I said, I am going to try and put that together. I promise you there is some deeper calculus that really, really shows it. But it is still, I mean, I, I don't know that I can visualize really deeply how this turns into this. At the moment, this is something that we are excited that we can do, and we may sort of have to wait a little bit on an understanding of, of what that means. So in the previous example, we did a number, 5, raised to an imaginary power, i. 
In this example, we're going to be doing something that has a real number, 6, raised to a complex number, 2 minus 3i. I'd like to give you an opportunity to do some of this on your own, but I do think you need to talk a little bit about how to start the beginning of this. So in the beginning of this, we need to use a property of exponents that would allow me to break this into two pieces. Okay. I want to write this as 6 squared times 6 to the negative 3i. And the thing that allows me to do that is, this is a, this is more unsimplifying. Um, if I have two things like this that have the same base, I'm allowed to add the powers together, right? So this really is the same thing as 6 to the 2 plus negative 3i, and that's what I had here. The reason that I want to do that is that it's going to allow me to take this thing and figure it out separately, and then this one over here, and treat it the same way that we did this one. Okay. Um, we will need to sort of take care as we work through this one. You're going to follow the same process that we did on the previous one. If you feel comfortable about doing that, pause the video and work through it. If not, I'll be walking through it right here. So my 6 squared here is 36. So I have 36 times. Now over here, my method previously was I want to take 6 and I want to rewrite it as e to a power. So what power do I raise e up to in order to get 6? Well, that's going to be the natural log 6 power. So that means I can rewrite my 6 as e to the natural log 6. And that's all going to be raised to the negative 3i power. Okay. Now, try and think back on what we did in the previous problem. What did I do in the previous one once I was in a position like this? Hopefully you remember that what I did is I remembered that one of my properties of exponents allows me to, when there's a power raised to a power, I multiply those powers together. So now this is... 36 times e to the negative 3 natural log 6 i. And now that I have that, this thing is in the form, and it, it's, it's messy, but this is e to the i theta. And now this thing even has an r. So now I'm going to take this, and I can write this in polar form. 36 cis negative 3 natural log 6. And then from here, if I want to convert this thing into a plus bi form, if I want to sort of have like a sense of what this thing is, like as a, as a number that I could, could maybe look at and think about, I'm just going to take this and make it 36 cosine negative 3 natural log 6 plus 36i sine negative 3 natural log 6. And at this point, I mean, if I want a number for this, I'm going to need to use a calculator for it. Calculator gave me that this was 22.2 plus 28.4i. And again, if you wanted to confirm this on your calculator, know that you can just do 6 to the 2 minus 3i, and it'll give you this. Now, I mean, this is some, some sort, of, sort of fascinating stuff here. Um, you may have noticed that many of the times when we do these, our answers are winding up being complex, but they're not always complex. In fact, that very first thing we, one that we did when we, we very first started this lesson out, we did e to the i pi minus 1 and found that that was negative 2. So this one was real. Um, I definitely think there's some interesting questions here of like when do these wind up being complex? When do they wind up being real? When are they nice numbers? When are they wild, weird numbers? Um, I think there's a lot of potential here for things that could be explored if they're things that, that you all are interested in. Speaking of exciting problems, the next one that I have is, is amazing, and, and I really, really hope you enjoy it. All right, here we go. This is amazing, right? So we're going to use our calculators, and I want you on your calculator to do i to the i power. Okay? So when you do this in your calculator, you find that this is 0 0.20. Eight. And I mean, it goes on, but it's real, okay? Um, so now step B in this problem is stop freaking out that I to the I is a real number. Uh, my wife actually just walked in before I started this section, uh, and, and I mentioned this to her, and she had some very, very choice words um, for the fact that I to the I power is, is real. 
Um, but let's try and make sense of this because there's 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 a reason that this makes sense, and so let's let's take a look at it. Um, well, rather, there's at least math that justifies it. Whether it makes sense to you or not is is up to you. So step C, I want us to find the modulus and argument of I using an argand diagram. So if you imagine I on an argand diagram, where is I on an argand diagram? If this is the real axis and this is the imaginary axis, then I is right here, just up one. Okay, so that means that the modulus of I is one and the argument of I is pi over two. And that means that for step D, that means that I could express I, I is basically one E to the I pi over two. In other words, I is E to the I pi over two. And if you maybe don't believe me on that one, you can punch that in your calculator. We can punch in E to the I pi over two. Sure enough, it comes back and tells us that that's I, okay? So now part E is asking us, okay, hence find the exact value of I to the I. So if, if, you're, if you're feeling bold and you want to look at this one on your own, go ahead and pause the video. How does, how does us doing this, remember that hence is supposed to be, you know, using what you've done before. So how does this step help me to work through what this is going to be? Well, let's see here. Our, our method before was that when we had an imaginary power, we wanted to change the base into having a base of E. So now that I know that i is e to the i pi over 2, I could write this as e to the i pi over 2 to the i. And then our properties of exponents let us multiply exponents together. That means this is e to the i squared pi over 2. But we know that i squared is negative 1, so this is just e to the negative pi over 2. And I mean, that that's the exact, so i to the i power is not just 0 0.208 dot dot dot, some seemingly weird random real number. It's actually a very specific one. It's e to the negative pi over 2. And again, if you want to sort of like confirm and make sure that you're not like just going nuts, um, sure enough, when I punch e to the negative pi over 2 in my calculator, it gives me back this number that I had before. Step F, you don't get points for this on the IB exam, but we breathe. We've unlocked some really, really, really neat things that we can do with complex numbers. Um, and I'm sure that you're surprised that we can do this, but mathematicians shouldn't be surprised. When we allow something like the imaginary number in, one of the things I talked about many, many lessons ago, or, or when you have a new number, the, 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 that number and your operations need to be closed. You can't do I to the I and be like, oh no, I need, I need J. I need some super imaginary number. Like this, this thing needs to be sort of like a self-contained thing that we can work with. So I hope you enjoyed this problem and that you sort of got a chance to see that all of this math really does work together. These things connect to one another um, and we get some really, really exciting results in the end. So I have one final thing to share with you in this video, and that's that this relationship between Euler's form, polar form, complex numbers, this even allows us to extend our understanding of trigonometric functions. There's actually a lot more that we can do with this that we'll be doing sort of later in the class. I'm not going to try and fit it in right now. I want to sort of f wrap up the section that we're on and come back and review some of this deeper stuff a little bit later. So in this last example, I want to be showing you some of this connection. So first I want us to consider the expression e to the iz minus e to the negative iz. So in part a, I want us to show something. Show that e to the iz minus e to the negative iz is 2i sine z. Again, wild, but, but let's take a look at it and see what we can figure out. So in part a, remember that when I've got e raised to an imaginary power, I can basically write that in cis notation. So e to the iz, this first thing, is cosine z plus i sine z. So that's my first thing. So I have that minus, and now I'm going to do the other thing. This will be cosine negative z 
plus i sine negative z. Okay? So if I go through and sort of simplify this a little bit more, and actually maybe you guys remember, when we have the, the negative of um, the argument of something like this, you guys remember that we can, we can effectively make it like the conjugate of the positive. So this other thing could be changed into cosine z minus i sine z. Another thing that lets us justify that, by the way, and you guys may remember this from last year, cosine is an even function, and when we have an even function, when you plug in negative z, you get back the same thing as if it was positive z. And sine is an odd function, so when I plug in negative z, I get the opposite of if I had plugged in positive z. So now I'm going to sort of work out the rest of this thing. This is cosine z plus i sine z, and this is subtracted. So when I subtract this, cosine z plus i sine z, distributing this negative in, minus cosine z plus i sine z. The cosine z's drop out, and I have two of these left. 2i sine z. Check. Sometimes at this point I write something like, this is what we wanted to show. Actually, as I was typing it, what I, what I realized that I normally say is I usually say, which is what we set out to show. Set out makes it sound a little more like a quest, like you set out on a, like a quest to show that this thing is that. Anyway, now I've shown that, yay. So now part B is saying, hence, find the value of the sine of 3i. Okay, so just when you thought that things could not get any weirder, um, I'm now going to look at taking the sign of imaginary things. And I guess my thinking is, we just showed that this thing here is this. So that means that 2i sine of 3i, all I'm doing here is I'm just sort of replacing the z with a, with a 3i. So 2i sine 3i would have to equal e to the i times 3i minus e to the negative i times 3i. All right, so that means over here on the left, I've got 2i sine 3i. Over here, these i's come together and give me negative 1. So this is going to be e to the negative 3. These i's also come together and give me negative 1, which means it's going to be positive 3 there, so e cubed. And then the last thing I need to do is sort of move this 2i over. Now here's the thing. I don't really want to divide that i over, because then I end up with an i in the denominator. Some of you have sort of noticed as we've, as we've been going along. You can also get rid of an i by multiplying both sides by i. Right? Think about that for a second. When I do that on the left, there's going to be i squared over here. So this is just negative 2 sine of 3i. And on the right, I just I wind up with an i over here. This is just going to be e to the negative third minus e to the third i. And then the last thing I need to do is just divide this negative 2 over. The sine of 3i will be negative 1 half e to the negative third minus e cubed i. wild. Um, and generally a problem like this is not something that you're going to need to do. Like the, the IB exam isn't just going to say find the sine of 3i. It would be something like this where they sort of walk you through it. They'd start by show this relationship and then you would use this relationship to find that result. So I know this lesson was, was probably kind of a wild ride. We, we covered a lot of stuff and, and we, we used i in a really powerful way. So I hope that all that made sense. If you have questions, as always, please ask them. And I wish you best of luck in, in working through these and practicing these and, and appreciating all of this cool stuff that we can do with complex numbers.